Hello, and welcome to Movie of the Year, the only podcast on the internet with the science and the screaming to de- determine what is the single greatest movie of any given year. The year now is 1982, and tonight we are talking about 1982's biggest blockbuster, and it's rare on the show that we actually talk about the movie that made the most amount of money in that year, E.T., the Extra Terrestrial. Is that the E.T. we were supposed to watch? Oh, come on, Greg. Did you fuck that up again? Ah, darn. I was watching Entertainment Tonight. Tonight is a game show in which two contestants will be competing for the my love, my companionship. They will get points based on what they say and how they say it. Our first contestant, uh, you just heard, is Greg. It's me. I spoke out of turn. I'm sorry. I think I might know the answer, Ryan, to the question of what is 1982's movie of the year. I think it might be E.T., the extraterrestrial. Really? Yeah, I'm going to jump right out there and say, this. we have said this before, and I wish we hadn't. This might be the perfect movie. Now, Greg, you've never seen Fitzcarraldo. I have never seen Fitzcarraldo. Yeah, okay, so I I will reserve judgment, but I was... I'm going to say blown away by this, like really swept up, really, really emotionally involved in a way that I just did not anticipate happening for a movie I've seen 30 times. Now, Greg, before I ask you about how you felt about the movie, why don't you look into our studio audience? I will. This is White Men Can't Jump Style. All righty. I will let you pick any person in this audience to come up here and compete against you for uh, Best Friend of Mine. I pick E.T. the Extraterrestrial. <laughs> I will take you down. Oh, and Mike just shoved an alien to the ground. <laughs> Fuck off, it. you dusty white bitch. <laughs> you look like a cat turd. Yeah, is E.T. when he's healthy is brown, and when he gets old is gray. Is, is E.T. dog poop? <laughs> yep. <laughs> the healthier, like the slimier he is, the healthier he is. I feel like I never noticed until this viewing how deeply slimy E.T. is. Which, no judgment, yeah. but... And not just physically. Now, Greg just got a point, here. not because he is talking about the sliminess, but because uh, he liked the movie. Mike, what did you think about E.T., the extra... Ter- and you know what? From Just for the rest of the show, I'm just going to say E.T. Like, and can I just say the extraterrestrial? We'll understand that that means the extraterrestrial. I, I mean, you did it this week, and you watched the wrong E.T., but hopefully now <laughs> you get it. I watched Entertainment Tonight, The Extraterrestrial. <laughs> no, that's NBA. I was still blown away, though. Did you notice? Yeah. No. yeah <laughs> man, emotionally invested. What is Mario Lopez going to do next? You love John Tesh. Uh, Mike, did you like this movie? I liked it. Uh-oh. Oh, no. Oh. Ryan, did you hear the tone of his voice? <laughs> Yeah, wow. that's where the that's the how you say it there, folks. I wanted to give a good demonstration where I said the same thing they said, but... It's the how you said it. I guess I was so ready to be swept away and remained next to the dustpan instead of being swept into it. Okay. You're going to lose this show. This episode is so bad. It's ridiculous. Uh, I'm just going to stunt on you really hard. In fairness, uh, Mike has hired John Williams to score his life. And so when he sees a John Williams movie with a little bit of score, John Williams did a little bit of music for this movie. Yeah, you may have heard him Tash. pop in every once in a while briefly. Uh, a, a real light touch on this <laughs> one, John. Uh, so, yeah. It's I wonder not that how big I should feel in this moment. No, no, that's how. Okay, I got it. <laughs> I, I will tell both of you this and our listeners, I guess. Um, I'm so glad to be hosting this episode because I do not think my little glowing heart could take having to talk about this movie in as depth uh, as depthful as you guys have to uh, to be in a competition about this movie, this I agree with Greg. This is a fucking perfect movie, and to st- to to put yourself outside of a dustpan or inside of the dustpan, but not getting fully in the trash can, one of the worst <laughs> reviews for any movie I've ever heard. <laughs> it's just disgusting saying it to fully me. Swept. I guess I, my fan. We were Mac and me kids, so yeah. For me, it was almost a religious experience, which I bet Steven Spielberg would be like amazed that i took that away from it that it was somehow almost seemed like religious in nature but that was the part that i really responded to i think you'd I, be like yeah the jesus metaphor is there greg i don't think that's absurd <laughs> do you think do you think i was while i was watching it i was like there's something lurking under the surface here but i can't <laughs> quite figure it out glowing heart always has like a blanket over his head like a robe what chapter in the bible was it where jesus came back Float her up in the air and then blast it off into space with a little rainbow <laughs> behind him. 
<laughs> well, even the rainbow is like evocative of the Bible, right? Uh, Noah, uh, Noah's Ark and the the yeah, the, the, the rainbow is the covenant with Lord, the Lord that he'd never destroy life again. So the Bible yeah. supports gay people. Yeah, Noah, that boat was full of queers. Honestly. <laughs> Honestly, uh, if you think about it, the sad thing about one of the sad things about this movie is that like 30 years after E.T. left, people would start being like, we should kill people that don't like E.T. And then from that point <laughs> forward, they'd be like putting E.T.'s face on their shields as they ran into crowds. To <laughs> and he's just like, what? <laughs> no, I just said the other. Isn't that the ultimate story of Jesus? Like, hey, everybody, be cool with everyone. You mean kill people who won't say they love you? Who, no. What? Whoa, <laughs> guys, <hey>. guys, <laughs> is this thing on? Come back here, you silly billies. I was talking about love. Well, folks, you're about to hear Mike get absolutely decimated in <laughs> a, a show. <laughs> so I revel in it. <laughs> Let's take a break. And when we come back, E.T. that nope, just E.T. <laughs> Lonely and bored on the set of Raiders of the Lost Ark, little Stevie Spiels got to talking to Melissa Matheson. They're visiting her boyfriend, Harrison Ford. He told her about an imaginary friend he made up when he was a kid, an alien companion who somehow filled in the voids he felt as an only child with a missing dad. Matheson cranked out a script, and the twosome somehow avoided getting denied by Columbia Pictures, being forced to make it a Close Encounter sequel, and a version of the movie called Night Skies, a much darker script about aliens terrorizing a family. More on that in a couple weeks when we do Poltergeist. Two years later, Spielberg and Matheson's little movie about an alien friend would go on to beat Star Wars as the highest grossing movie of all time, get nominated for nine Oscars, and win four of them. Richard Attenborough, who directed Gandhi, the movie that beat E.T. for Best Picture, and who would later star in the movie that would beat E.T. for highest grossing film as John Hammond, reportedly said that it was bullshit Gandhi won Best Picture and Best Director. <laughs> he said those awards belonged to E.T. <laughs> <laughs> Taste buds, Not Steven. <laughs> Taste buds, I ask you this. Does this movie over Jaws, over Close Encounters, over Schindler's List, over Jurassic Park, over War Horse prove to be Steven Spielberg's <laughs> Spielbergiest movie? This is the Spielbergiest movie. Yes. This movie will teach you how to watch Spielberg movies. I Watching this movie, I thought about Blur. AI so much because I was like, why was I surprised at the way AI looked? Why was I surprised at the way mm. AI went? This man tells you how to watch his movies Right in E.T. This is a manual for... And I think if someone found E.T., like some E.T. in the future, found it, they would know how to make movies. This teaches yeah. you... This is a manual about how to tra Correct. like translate your thoughts into the audience's mind using the visual medium. At the very least, teach you how to make movies that are about children and parenting that are two letters. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Nails that. <laughs> but his, his whole series. Uh, I can't think of somebody else who over-directs the way Spielberg does. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but it doesn't get annoying. Like, you're like, oh, I'm going to feel this way in this scene. Cool. Like, yeah, it's just, I'm following this guy the whole way through. And throw it, uh, this is probably my favorite score of all time. This or Superman. And John Williams is not my favorite guy. But mm -hmm. uh, to direct this movie like Spielberg does and then be like, and we need John Williams. Is that's some audacity, folks? <laughs> and like we said just, in the intro, John Williams is here, everybody. It's like, the wall of sound version of emotions. Where but we're just I gonna think, lay you up with it. I think it's the same thing. I think the score is the same thing you said, Mike, about the like you feel the heavy handedness of the score, but it just mm -hmm. doesn't bother you. In part because the both Steven Spielberg and John Williams correctly guess exactly where you are emotionally mm -hmm. like you it, it's a very honest and a very accurate like engagement with the audience and if they were off even by a little bit it would feel schmaltzy right. but they keep you like right like, in the pocket really you're this right is lonely there. this is sad this yeah. is magical and every time you're like yeah it's checking yes, those it boxes. Is, <laughs> good job glad you guys gave me a pamphlet <laughs> um uh, yeah, and I like we talk a lot about like the Tarantinoization of film in the late '90s. Of like, mm -hmm. was it worth it to get Pulp Fiction with all the bullshit that no nobody is more responsible for terrible movies than Spielberg? Because <laughs> there's so many people saying, "Oh, I get it. You just like Shawshank Redemption is basically because of this. We yeah. can make a bullshit movie. Just pull the strings, make yeah, it obvious, and everyone will <laughs> love it." But that's the thing. It, it it you have to you have to be as good as Spielberg is and and make it look as easy as he does. That's the and thing. Like you think that what he's doing is just like replicable, but it's not because you don't understand the world. You're not a human the way, the way he, he is a human. I mean, and like a lot of people are saying that, or a lot of people have said in the past, like, you know, the, the schmaltiness turns them off. And 
to me that means they've never seen E.T. or they have no heart like Michael over here. But he has Scorsese, John Ford level filmmaking talent. Yeah. And then decided to make these types of movies, which is just a, such a fucking knockout. Anybody who has this sort of talent will try to usually make, uh, you know, movies that change cinema in like a dark, gritty, yeah, you know, or, or even like Bergman esque, where, uh, you know, it's going to be super heady. Yeah. And he's like, no, I'm the most talented filmmaker, and I'm going to make movies for children. Well, he tells you why his his directorial thesis is in this movie, where he says it's not about thoughts. It's yes. about feelings. This is the movie, or this is Mike. the line that uh, stuck out to me so much in this time, Mike. where um, somebody's, they're trying to understand the relationship between E.T. and Elliot, and somebody asks his older brother, so wait, he, can, he thinks E.T.'s thoughts? And he's like, no, he feels E.T.'s feelings, and that is Steven Spielberg. And in the, in the 80s, the idea that you would have empathy for somebody else was just so revolutionary, and it's weird because we need that same understanding now et2 like, baby let's do it man thank god we don't have an et2 oh <laughs> well, my gosh don't I we thought... isn't phantom menace or the second one yeah. et2 plus we covered the sequel on the show et mama tambien wasn't that it e- uh, wait, et, ET has a threesome on the judgment beach. day they come back and they're fucking pissed the flower <laughs> we took not sucks now we're gonna le- <laughs> level your whole fucking planet yeah just to have a you know, in a xenophobic culture, to have an alien come in that doesn't want to attack everyone. Yeah. Which is, that's what movies want to do is say, like, see, the people who are trying to invade us want to hurt us. And they were like, in that intro I read, everyone tried to say, no, 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 we have to make this guy evil. Yeah. That's how aliens, and I'm using the term aliens very loosely. I'm not talking about illegal Xenomorphs. aliens at all. Um, oh. Like, they want to kill us, and Spielberg was like, well, what if one didn't? Yeah, what if they just, like, liked plants and stuff, and they they had evolved? Maybe, because I think his thesis, which is, I love how the movie doesn't go out of its way to explain, like, E.T.'s people, and what their planet's mm-hmm. called, and where they come from, and why they're so moist. Uh, <laughs> instead, he just, <laughs> well, like... Well, sex are moist, Greg. <laughs> Not true. <laughs> oh, buddy, you need to lotion up. Your your nutsack is you often need, like moist. Like I guess we live in a you different know, area. We don't got that. We don't got <laughs> We don't have this. The There's nobody in the audience who wants to hear that. Not even Mo. <laughs> moist stuff. <laughs> um, where were we? We were talking about ET, the extraterrestrial. <laughs> yeah, his family. Moist. Oh yeah, the that, 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 uh, he doesn't go out of his way to explain exactly what's going on with the people, but clearly mm. they just like he. The one of the theses for the movie is clearly like if you are going to get to the part where you can get to other planets, you have probably conquered that thing where you just want to destroy everyone all the time, and that's what ET has. He is spiritually very evolved because right. to get to the stars, you're going to have to survive the part where everybody wants to murder everybody else constantly. He did try right. and steal some plants though. <laughs> and that's customs is not audience like you should have seen the shrug that right just <laughs> laid on me <laughs> um i real quick too i want to talk like so much of this is clearly spielberg and his childhood and we're getting spielberg's roma belfast this year yeah um so we're, we're about to get hit with this again uh later i want to talk about the family life and you know the suburbs of it all but there's another thing going on here too uh, with all of the pop culture in the movie, pop culture is, I think, really important to Spielberg. You know, he comes from that uh, sort of group with Lucas and Scorsese of we make movies because we did nothing but watch movies. Mm-hmm. And did you guys notice? And eventually, this would lead us to have to watch Ready Player One, which sucks. But <laughs> did you guys notice that uh, so much in here is not just pop culture on the walls? And I thought a very like natural. This is how kids live setting, but. E.T. is getting all of his ideas from watching movies, reading yeah. comic books, you know, like using toys and reimagining them in probably the same way Spielberg did with his action mm-hmm. figures. And yeah, I uh, think Spielberg was more E.T. than Elliot. Yeah, I'm not exactly. I'm to say it. Oh, yeah, right. for sure. And, you know, repurposing them so that they are, instead of solitary devices devices that bring people together i thought it was interesting like the the speaking right. spell or whatever he turns that into part of the phone and it's like mm-hmm. he translates some of that isolation into communication which is really like right. what et has been doing the like entire time 
and and I think Spielberg's doing that with the movie because E.T. feels watching his first movie so strongly, Elliot has to sweep a girl off her feet mm-hmm. and kiss her because E.T. is being swept away by the film, which is clearly what Spielberg yeah. is being like. This is what movies did to me, so me and Johnny Wills are going to make you feel the way I feel when I watch movies. And also, <laughs> and also, like, isn't there something naturally empathetic about like narratives and movies where we we naturally feel for somebody else and is it cheesy to say that maybe there's some way that can help us save the world that we yes. can have the sort of cultural um cultural like revolution the, the or or spiritual or emotional or empathetic revolution within ourselves that make us into better people and that maybe m- movies like this are actually a way to literally do that even though it's a fictional tale they've done studies people who read fiction are more right. empathetic than people who don't because of that because it is literally putting you in the mind of other people so after you finish that book you have to walk a mile on their shoes and you're like oh they view the world differently than me uh, uh, yeah i mean i can completely attribute my liberalism not to me being a nice person but uh no you're a dickhead right <laughs> so you would think i would be right. conservative but i can completely attribute it to i watched every movie i could as a kid yeah. have all different walks of life and cultures. Mm-hmm. And that is, you know what we're doing here. I think that this is going to become the, the overall thesis of this season, because in the, in the future, we're going to watch poltergeist and we're going to watch the thing. And we're going to watch people attacking nice white families, you know, and nice white groups of people. And this is like, this is sort of what we thought. And I think this movie is going to stand out among them. Did it do its story better than those did? When they told the opposite story, we don't know yet. But I feel like this is going to become a thing. Also, how he, he saw the, the the Matrix line and saw the way everybody else he zigged when they zagged. I or just he made that up. Or he's just not a fucking chip bag. Like he yeah, he doesn't the, have that fear in him. Right, exactly. Like that fear presents itself even if you're not making a movie about xenophobia. If you're xenophobic, it comes out. What, what, one of the coolest things is this movie has a lot of fear in it. But as a filmmaker, there's no everybody's afraid and then handles it but there's no thing to be afraid of nobody's like right i was right to be afraid they all learn they're like oh right. and i listened for a second now i'm cool right. everybody's for a, a second everybody's afraid when they're alone mm-hmm. and they exist in a culture that is constantly fracturing them but when they pull together they're actually not afraid they're I, able to function and and to get something done i love how the spine of this movie's structure storytelling structure is it you know isn't necessarily you know, adventure, but it is pulling one trusted person in at a time. At a time, yeah. yeah and that's how, and like now we're all one big family. All right, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about what the three of us were wearing in 1982. <laughs> Diapies. Mount Rushmore. You know what the music means? It's Mount Rushmore time. It's time to dive deeper into the year that was 1982. Tonight, we are doing. Fashion, the fashion of 1982. This is a little bit before our time, so I don't know how we did research because we're not just going to Google fashion of 1982. That's for a shitty podcast. That's called first thought, and I'm offended that anybody would say that. First thought, worst thought. Every show and every news clip that I could find from 1982. (laughs) Now, because I'm hosting one of these, might get an extra two points. We decided that five was far too many. Um, Although if Greg says what I'm thinking, that's why not give him five points? Like, I know. It's already going to be 100 to 40. So. I already said E.T. was the perfect movie. Yeah. Uh, so, Mike, I guess we'll start off with you then. See if you can get it. Good luck, bro. I'm, I'm going to get the easy one out of the way. Uh, in the 80s, it, you were cool if your shoulders were as wide yeah. as possible. I don't want to be able to walk through a door normally. It's shoulder pads, man. They should be in everything on every gender. Why don't we have big, bulky, angular shoulder pads? What? Like, so often fashion... Oh, good job, Mike. Mike. So often fashion will, like, come back. Yeah. But sometimes it can't because it was so fucking ridiculous. Yeah. Wh- who even at this point was like, yeah, let's make everyone look like football players. I don't know, but, like, my mom was very slight in the 80s, and then she would get dressed to, like, go to work, and she would come out and just look like she was, like, an American gladiator or something. <laughs> just ready like, to throw you to the ground. <laughs> Jewel! The, the, the tinier the person's shoulders were naturally, the more, like, obscene it was mm-hmm. when they came out with this jacket that was just, like, so on puff that it would be, like, <laughs> seven inches above their ear. 
but you know, I think it was about projecting power, and it was it was about trying to make sartorial choices that would sort like, of leveling the playing people. field. Yeah, I think specifically in women's fashion, it was about not having to wear something um, demure, and instead, right. like you know, sort of getting in there and literally like kind of armoring up to go into the workplace why not have pants then that look like you have two honking balls <laughs> just big old truck nuts truck pants. nuts <laughs> on the pants <laughs> trouser nuts uh yeah that one's on for sure it's just the most 80s thing greg what do you got along with those uh broad shoulders you would get very exaggerated sleeves mm-hmm. so um like uh, a w- an extremely wide sleeve or a drapey sleeve um, luminous like morticia yeah i really in in you know it this is the beginning i think of the 80s more 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 aesthetic and part of that is they're just like bring the fabrics bring all of them like put <laughs> like pack them into the shoulders or put them onto the sleeves of of the garment like it's it's just as much well, as you could possibly get it's because the, the the fashion designers at the time remembered World War II and having to shove everything they owned in one little bag, and they're like, yes. "What if that was already in my clothes?" <laughs> Take a bindle then with you. Why aren't you bringing a bindle wherever you go? Ryan, this is Their the eighties. The bindle, bindle is over in nineteen eighty two. Okay, the It'll bindle back peaks in mid seventies, <laughs> where hobo culture briefly took off. Don't dress like a terrorist. Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but all my friends are. <laughs> and then it's just a hobo with a knife in his head. I. For Ow. people who are wondering what we're talking about, um, well, that conversation, watch E.T., the extraterrestrial. But with this clothes stuff, I highly recommend the movie Working Girl, yes. which is like six, seven years after E.T. or 82. But uh, specifically, Joan Cusack is going to be responsible for all of this stuff. She Like hair that could barely fit into a room and just sleeves for days. Yeah, like, when- You could see your sleeves from a mile away. People in the 80s would typically slightly turn to one side or the other to walk through a doorway because you were going to be too puffed up to get right. in normally. That's going to go on the maybe pile for now. Mike, what do you got? A, a thing that, that makes the shoulders seem even broader and the sleeves even more poofy. It's uh, having a belt, uh, often chunky, to just cinch that waist in. So you put on just a fitted sheet that's flapping all around as a shirt, mm-hmm. and then you put on a belt to... Make that waist look real small. So, like, why are you putting on a sheet? Volume. Volume. Because 80s was the time of volume. Okay. And then you 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 put on that belt that's, like, more... I guess women wear their belts. Like, the belt around your belly button to tie it all together. Big belt. Cinch belt. Flowy dress. All right. That's on the baby pile. Greg, what do you got? Um, More, more, more. How do you like it? Well, I really like it a lot. And I want that not just in my shoulders. I want it not just in my chunky belt. I want it not just in my big sleeves. I want the patterns to literally have their own patterns. And maybe <laughs> those patterns have a third pattern on them. A tertiary pattern, Ryan. Is this like a shirt that Tim Robinson would wear? Yes. Dude, yes. Yeah, this is the kind of shirt that would like bankrupt Tim Robinson. <laughs> <laughs> All right? If Tim Robinson went back to the 80s, he would go into si- inside every clothing store. Oh, yes, he would. He would go into <laughs> every single clothing store. It... um. And it was like mixing patterns too, but I swear the patterns themselves would be like stripes with polka dots, and those polka dots would have like leather t- print, leopard print on them themselves. <laughs> it was just, I, it had to be everything all the time. And so, do you think this was everybody, or was this fashionable people? Was it like if you went to the mall, was a hundred percent of people just looking disgusting? No, look, look at ET and how the kids dress. It's still hoodies and like. Long sleeve polo shirts. We're talking yeah. about, I mean, really, I, I think a lot of times we're talking about the fashion that was in the process of filtering from the runway yeah, these to squares the rich, rich people yeah. and then beyond. And so I think for some of these, we're maybe kind of projecting ahead from what the average person w- would really wear. But I think you see the layers with Elliot's mom. Uh-huh. Um, and I think when when she, ser- when she dresses up as a cat, she's got a lot of print going on. So I think Winston's shirts. Yeah, dude, Which, from New Girl? From New Girl, oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess I should say that. That's not just our friend yeah. Winston. I mean, he's <laughs> our friend, he obviously. Winston? Winnie the Bish. Uh, that, like, you know, we as a group have sort of taken on wearing those. Uh, that's the first recovery of what 1982 did. Like, his patterns, like, now it's barely okay well, to start wearing them again. It's a pattern. It's, it's right. not 18 shirts in one shirt. <laughs> that, We're not going to Dan Flash's. <laughs> that, that is on the mountain, Mike. Where are you at? Uh, 
I think I, going with the more is more. I want so much boot that it starts to fall off my leg. The slouchy boots that just, they are too heavy to fight against gravity. And like Captain was, America pirate boots? It was a knee-high yeah, boot, dude. and then it just fell it and pulled over, around right? the ankle. Yeah, it's too heavy for its own. Blackbeard's boots. Mike. Yes. Why? Are, why? That one, I, I think, looks cool. It's better than the shoulder pads, but... It's more leather, man. More cows had to die. You had to pay more money. Murder. Takes up more spot, more space in your closet. I'm going to call them floppy boots. Floppy, floppy boots. boots. Floppy boots. Floppy, floppy boots. That is on the mountain. We have one spot left. So let's go to speed round. Greg, what do you got? Okay, I'm going to say layers. I did not see a single fashion uh, trend from the 80s that didn't include just layer upon layer upon layer mike this owned the 80s but in 1982 a little fitness video by one jane fonda came out and she was wearing these weird sleeves on her legs leg warmers were very 1982 and greg and and leg warmers that should come back it came back very briefly it should come back again i think are you late school (laughs) always um i'm gonna say chunky oversized costume jewelry um, really big, what would be considered gaudy in almost any time, certainly the equivalent of those patterns in jewelry <laughs> form. The leg warmers with the little strap at the bottom mm-hmm. to like, that's how it stays on your foot, I guess. That was the secret answer. Oh, Mike. damn! <laughs> Mike. Mike. Don't forget how much Mike hates E.T., the extraterrestrial. I know, you're going to yeah. get a lot of points. Okay, yeah, I'm just saying, don't forget During that. our next commercial break. Yeah, I'm just good. Fucking <laughs> well, throw I assume the so next taste bud is, do you I, love E.T.? <laughs> I haven't actually won on this season yet. Um, okay, so your Rushmore for 1982 fashion is shoulder pads. Woo! Very highly patterned everything. Floppy boots and leg warmers. When we come back, more E.T. All right, gentlemen, back to E.T. The movie very pointedly takes place in the burbs during the breaking of a family. It's very pointedly not in the big city with a mom and dad who love each other. How does this change, shape, create everything about the movie? One thing I thought was interesting is uh, at first they speak of the father as just like no longer around. And there is mm -hmm. a tension in in whether or not this dad is dead or not. And I thought the role of like divorce being the new the new dead dad uh for lack of a better term (laughs) but like that's the dad is zero present in this movie he might as well be dead and he's even gone south to mexico like it's like he's gone to the underworld in a way and or like the dog is free on the farm now somewhere (laughs) (laughs) the whole time i was they smell his clothes say he left mexico but he died oh as a cod that smelling the clothes thing was rough stuff. That's the mo- one of the most emotional things. I've ever- I mean, that is that shows you how the- you do that when somebody's dead. Uh-huh. That's when you right. smell their clothes. That's how much this guy's not fucking around. Because when you left your, f- a lot of times, like in the early '80s, when you left your family, like you left your wife, you left the whole fucking family. Yeah. you were just done, and you might well, just the wife start was your over favorite again. one. So yeah. <laughs> you're not going <laughs> to fucking talk to the kids. <laughs> but you, uh, you, at least you don't have to hear that dad always being like, oh, "I'm fat, so I burp and fart." You know, Classic that is better. 80s dad. That's th- I mean, that is the most dad, 80s dad thing I've ever heard. Um, <laughs> there's a point when they're smelling the shirt that Elliot says, like, oh, maybe we'll do that again sometime. And the older brother is like, mm, mm, yeah, uh, OK, but uh, the Mexico thing. Look, it's totally fine to get a divorce. It's totally fine to once you get a divorce to take the new stepmom to Mexico. That's not how this is played. No. This is clearly I fucking bailed and it's party time. And here's the crazy thing. The kids knew the mom didn't. And so she is here in the suburbs. Yeah. I think that you could uh, argue, I guess, there's not a ton of evidence for this, but you could argue that they did live in the city. You know, they did uh, have Th- there's a There's a new house life. vibe. Yeah. And fucking a house that none of us will ever be able to afford, by the way. But uh, so And the- has probably since burned down. I mean, they are in fire country, and there's been like oh, yeah. hundreds and hundreds of fires since then. There's no way that thing is still there. Uh, but yeah, this is a whole, we're getting used to a whole new life here, and it's it, I think it's one of the many many like ways that Elliot and Et are the same. We're in a whole new world. Well, that's I, I their names are the, similar the, too. That's the, true. Yeah, oh, the Et. Yep, there you go. Stands for Elliot. Yep, there you go. <laughs> uh, no joke. I e- think that's true. Elliot is the brother. E- Elliot is the little girl. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Uh, E.T., his family seems to be camping. That's my vibe. Is He's the Elliot's age. They're camping in the Redwoods, as you do. 
uh, they get scared by lights and they leave their <laughs> fucking kid. Imagine, Ryan, you have a child. Imagine you're gone to Sedona, Arizona, and then you're like, oh shit, there's other cars here. And you just take off, you and your wife, and you leave your fucking kid there for weeks. What are the odds that Mike's dad, a handcar at Brooklyn, did all of this <laughs> stuff? <laughs> uh, they, I'm just saying, like, listen, Mike, they're so non interventionist. They are so. <laughs> they, they are so passive and they are are so non-violent that they would rather leave one of their own than risk having to to get involved because what are they going to do once these once that guy with a belt absolutely full of fucking keys mike which you cannot deny you can't deny that guy had keys all that janitor is walking yeah i saw keychains nine times and you know my thing if i don't see it 10 times i'm not sure it's actually that exists and those flashlights were high powered flashlights you can make fun of that if you want mike but in a movie that's absolutely full of light they each had basically a lightsaber and it in a movie that tries to avoid as many invaders from Mars stereotypes as possible, the fact that, like, we have to get out of here before we're found out, that's... Mm-hmm. Why would they give a shit? Also, like, it's very... Ki- like, okay, maybe it doesn't work in terms of, like, would this really happen? But if we take a step back and think of the fact that Elliot is literally abandoned by his dad and the emotional impact of the family being left by the dad has basically made the mom kind of isolated in her own way so that she's not there either. Right. He has literally been, uh, uh, figuratively, been abandoned well, by his parents yeah. and so it puts them in the same situation. The dad leaving makes space for Elliot to run amok space. like a latchkey kid, for sure. But the, I, I'm just saying that not enough people are talking about that. <laughs> E.T. also has shitty parents. <laughs> and to, to quote uh, what a movie I do think is perfect Mike. is if your dog is lost, you don't fucking sit on the curb and whine. You go get off your ass and you find your fucking dog. <laughs> and just insert dog for kid here. <laughs> yeah, we could have made that leap on our own, Mike. We understood what you were talking about. It sounds like you wish that the movie E.T. never even happened, Mike, because if they had stuck around and they had taken their child in a responsible I'm just fashion, saying shitty we'd have parents. zero of the, of the action of the movie. Also, another thing that I picked up on this watch, because do you guys notice that when you watch, I, when I watched this movie as a kid, let's say I probably watched it 10 times, I didn't even know that the dad was gone. Like, I didn't know it was broken. Yeah, thing. I'm not going to, well, I as just, a kid, well, I don't I look pay at attention the to that part. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> bring out, bring out I the knew, E.T. <laughs> I knew the dad was gone because it was a normal family. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna <Mike>. definitely <laughs> boom shakalaka. Definitely that one. Um, but one thing I never picked up on, and this is really out in the obvious, is that there was another Elliot 30 years ago. That they had done this shit before. They did this to Peter Coyote. Which may I point out that a lot of times where they think that there's noise outside and it's the FBI guys, they blame it on coyotes. No, it's not coyotes. It's Peter Coyote. He's out there. But the doctor, he says. Elliot, I used to be you. Yeah. And you could play that as I had an imaginary friend too, quote unquote. But I think the movie's playing it like, this is not the first time they've been here. This is why I'm the only adult you can trust. And in my head, when I was a kid, fuck Peter Coyote. Yeah. You know, like he's a fucking adult, so he's terrible. In actuality, he's Steven Spielberg. He is hitting on the mom a little bit too much. Because he. That, Just like any kid's friend who's an adult the, should do. The, the, the movie definitely, again, in a way that Spielberg doesn't go out of his way to make sure you know 100% it happens. I need a daddy. Clearly, he is going to be the new dad in the family and the new E.T. because he's also going to be the, like a, another Elliot bonded to Elliot. But yeah, definitely. He is like, he's coming in to, and I think he's Spielberg. I really do think that. He's the, he some, uh, because the movie says adults fuck you over adults are bad adults are the enemy and then it also says though but actually some don't lose the spark some don't Mm -hmm. lose the big red beating heart in their chest most do and they turn into dried up cat poop but some (laughs) continue to always have that heart and i'm one of those and elliot you can be too like you can go to that same spot you don't have to lose your heart Mm -hmm. What, what i found so fascinating is i remember watching it thinking all adults were bad and then watching it the, the mom comes around, like the science teacher is bad, but even all the people who are running around, they are trying to help Elliot and E.T. And he just keeps screaming, he, he's dying, you're hurting him. And as a kid, I was like, yeah, they're killing him. But even Michael is like, E.T.'s sick. And Elliot's reaction is like, nah, shut up. Like he is a little kid and just screams at anybody trying to get in the way of him and E.T. dying. E.T. is dying before the adults get involved. They're literally codependent though. Like, I mean, e- the, Elliot is it has a whole period where he can't face the idea that that ET is going to go. You know, ET the last right. the last thing ET says is come, and Elliot says stay. Right? Like, e- oh, they- shut up. <laughs> 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 you don't even like this movie, Mike. Uh, but like, so 
Elliot doesn't want what's doesn't really want what's best for E.T. There's this other part of love that I do think the movie explores, which is that love makes us say to somebody who needs to go that they mm-hmm. that they should stay. It really and does do even that. if it's hurting them. Yeah, but, but even if it's bad for them. That's that's why you should say, "Dad, go to Mexico." Dad, go to <laughs> Mexico for you. Party your ass off. Have a couple tecates. You know, have fun, man. Tequila takeoff, Dad. Tecate landing. That's how you sober. <laughs> All of that's true, but I think that there's this is besides all of the I'm gonna make a movie about Jesus, call it GT, no, <laughs> ET. Uh, all of that is there, but I also think it works for this theory of love that you're talking about, Greg, where we're going to get all of a lot of this type of tears out when Elliot or uh, when ET. <laughs> they're the same person in my head. When <laughs> ET dies, that's when we're all sad. Yeah, and mm. you don't know about blockbusters yet, unless you read Marvel comics of the '80s. You don't know that ET is coming back the first time you see this, right? And so you are beside yourself. Like, yeah, you are dude. weeping. The movie was just so fun, like ten minutes before this, and now <laughs> ET's fucking dead. But because that death happens, when if 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 it wasn't for that death, when ET leaves, that's where you would have those same kind of tears. Yeah, and but because he does go through the death part, and then he goes through the excitement of him coming back. Mm-hmm. Now Elliot is just an adult now, and he's saying, no, I'm doing what's best for the person I love. The person I'll probably love more than anybody for the rest of oh, my yeah. life. He's going to hold up every girlfriend or boyfriend up to E.T.'s memory for the rest just of his be like, fucking life. You say more than four words, dude. You are boring. <laughs> uh, and that's like, so uh, again, it's manipulation. It's structuring our tears, but I think it works flawlessly. And it's, it's, it, it is, yeah, it's child's tears and then mature tears. That it's, the second one is bittersweet. Which kids don't know what that is until 1982 and ET comes out. I mean, growing growing up is dying and being reborn, right? Like, and you can still come back and have like a heart that is like a child's heart. But when Elliot comes out of this, he's an adult. Like he has he has mm-hmm. changed and he will never be the same. And so that the death is appropriate in that way, but the rebirth is also appropriate because then he realizes. You can hang on to the feeling of somebody, but you can't hang on to the person. And shit, dude, Work. when you're growing up, that's what's going to happen to you. You're going right. to you're going to lose most of the people that everybody. are around you. Yeah, but you can have the feeling of them and you can have the memory of them in your heart. And he learns the important lesson, nobody you love ever actually dies. <laughs> it, it, that, <laughs> death is fake. <laughs> they just get divorced thing. and go to Mexico. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a break and when we come back, is it the Hall of Fame? To the Pop Filter Hall of Fame. That's right, gentlemen. It's the Hall of Fame. Been a while since we've been in these hallowed halls. These hallowed halls. They hallowed, hallowed them right hallowed, out. Hallowed, hallowed halls. Of course, it's located directly under all the Mount Rushmores we've built, which there are a lot. You would think that we would knock one down and then build mm-hmm. a new one. No, sir. That's not. We're not. There's we're not no those laws guys. in the sky. They are. Making a Rushmore dedicated to shoulder pads right now. <laughs> you know what? We've employed a lot of people in our construction business. Everyone knows the rules of the Hall of Fame. Um, we are about to induct some or zero people into the Pop Filter Hall of Fame. The uh, pop culture luminaries that have made the three of us who we are today. Mm-hmm. Um, we're each going to nominate one and then we're going to vote. You must get three votes to get in which means it's possible to get two one or zero and then we're like well two votes maybe if this person's nominated again I, to my knowledge we have never re-nominated ever somebody <laughs> tina fey yeah. oh i don't <laughs> want to spoil mike's so, okay mike you're up go ahead say your name uh no the the level of uh like deep depressing humanity and wit uh that this person brings to their roles uh, I think she's one of the best working actresses uh, ever. Well, certainly working currently. Uh, she can do literally it all, and she elevates even tiny roles and fucking destroys big movies. It's Olivia Coleman, and we're gonna get oh, her wow. in the Marvel universe soon. And I star think of Heartstopper, amazing star of Heartstopper, soon to be star of Secret Invasion. Did you did you take a brief tour through the hallowed halls? Do we? Is she really not in our? She is not. She's wow, not. I'm shocked. That doesn't mean I'm going to vote for her, but I'm just <laughs> shocked to hear that she's not already in our Hall of Fame. Yeah, I, I would say the last five, six years uh, in ev- literally everything, 
Yeah. yeah. When she and was in Heartstopper. Yeah. Uh, I, when she was in Heartstopper for, what, four minutes of yeah, total. eight episodes? Um, so, yeah, this is how British TV works. Wow. We should almost have a fast pass system. <laughs> like, <laughs> that feels like we should just be like, okay, well, she's in. What's next? Stamp her in. <laughs> All right, Greg, you're up. Mike, I thought you were describing my nominee <laughs> the last time we spoke of her on this show we all agreed that she should be in the pop filter hall of fame now that she's going up against olivia coleman i'm a little worried uh star of hacks uh one of the best parts of legion um fargo was in fargo and just always different always intense always interesting hilarious um it just absolutely mesmerizing on screen gene smart uh, and it really, for me, I loved her in Fargo. I loved her in everything. But seeing her in Hacks, I, it feels like a, an extra gear or something. And she mm. and her um, co-star really bring out the most in each other. And yeah, literally the last time we mentioned her, we were like, how's she not in the Hall of Fame? And so Also where I buy all of my denim pants. Okay. All right. <laughs> Mike, I thought that you were describing my nominee. I love uh, that about me. An actress who, um, you know, sort of brings the most to every role that she's in. And I will honestly say right here tonight, right now, that I don't know if we've talked about a single person from pop culture more in the three of our collected lives than Greta the Gremlin, the Lady Gremlin from the <laughs> end of Gremlins oh, 2, no. the new batch. Oh, no. Oh, I, no. It's hard to tell people how important this person is uh, to all of us. Uh, basically, drug us through puberty. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then uh, is sort of with us in spirit, if not form, every single day of our lives. Well, basically especially gets, in E.T. Basically gets mentioned in every single text conversation like, we have. Let's be real. How often is she texted about between the three of us? And like, it, we're not the kind of dudes who send pictures of girls to each other no with the with the with one exception and that's this gremlin. Greta the gremlin we have each texted a picture of her to each other very recently is this the thing we talk about the most but in real life and not very much on air i don't know i, I don't know how uh, she has to have made multiple appearances on this podcast it's hard for me to believe that we haven't talked about her she's like i mean her whole aesthetic was very very instructive to me <laughs> as a young person i like her aggressive sexuality was like became defining to me. <laughs> That's Let's just how <laughs> women are going to be. <laughs> <laughs> and then also the legendary reaction. Uh, she's trapped in a room with one of the characters, one of the villains of Gremlins too. Yep. And he looks at her and says, uh, "What? Uh, okay." And I think we all had that same reaction to Greta oh, the yeah. Gremlin. Beautiful hair. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're if Luscious. everybody at home like is picturing her, but like you might picture the makeup, you might picture the like uh like cave woman caveman outfit she's wearing. Mm -hmm. But I invite you to focus on her beautiful rich <laughs> green hair. Like she's it's wavy, it's so nice. And she knows how to flaunt it. Uh, I'm saying beautiful one of my eyes. next one of my next three tattoos for sure. Dude. Greta will be on my body soon. I am so tired of being attracted to the women you have tattooed on your body. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that it makes our complicated relationship like even more complicated. <laughs> Just look at my calves, Greg. I feel so. Are. I feel so bad for Gene Smart. <laughs> so again, uh, everybody only gets. Two votes? How does this work? Two yeah, votes. we each only get two votes. And our nominees are Olivia Coleman, Gene Smart, and Greta the Gremlin. We like the we ladies. Will we will start with Olivia Coleman. Mike, is she in? Yes. Greg? Uh, yeah, of course. I'm like, I'm still, part of me is still like, check the hall. She's already in there, so. Uh, Olivia Coleman is in. Yes! Mike. Stop looking at me. Is that her line? Stop looking at me! I hear you! Look uh, at me! I should have pulled back more. <laughs> Gene Smart, Mike. Any other class, man. Gene Smart would have slid right in there, but I, I cannot. Greg? It would be absolutely wrong of me. A derelict, dereliction of duty? A, dere a, a, a positive dereliction of duty. Um, I believe she b belongs in the hall. And um, I I brought her to the dance, so I ha I must dance with who I brung. I'm sticking with Gene Smart. I vote for Gene Smart to be oh, to no. be in the hall. And I vote no. Yeah. 
No, we, this is this is why it's hard to be in our Hall of Fame. You don't yeah. just waltz in, okay? You don't just waltz yeah. in. You I gotta earn you have it. To be brought to the dance and have the person dance with you. Still, there's a lot of complicated dancing <laughs> rules for our Hall of Fame. <laughs> and Mike, I guess it doesn't matter. But Greta the Gremlin. Uh, I cannot think of somebody who belongs. She should have been the first person we ever put in the Hall of Fame. I agree. That nobody. I can't think of anybody who means more to us as a threesome. Uh, Greg? I agree with that, too. And she should be the first person to ever be renominated. We make fun of Mike when he, like, nominates, like, an apple he had for lunch or something. But <laughs> when we have three good nominees, it, cause, it generally causes two of them to get bounced. And I, my vote is for Greta. So Gene and Greta are not in... Congratulations to Olivia Coleman. This is why Mike, women should Mike, not compete Mike. against each other. Yeah, we did. This they to have them. to. They have to. There should always yeah, only be one. That's how it happens, right? The men set them off against each other, and then most of them <gasps> a- end up getting harmed by it. And we're the men. Um, are we the patriarchy? We're not. Not the patriarchy, Mike. <laughs> we don't Shit. like the patriarchy, but I don't think we're like dismantling it. From the puppet that makes me the moist to the moistest puppet. <laughs> when we come back, let's get to E.T. Well, that is very, very funny or very sad. And perhaps now you have something to think about or very problematic. And perhaps we have something to think about. But in any event, I'm sure you have some reaction to what you're listening to. So why not check us out on the social media? You can go to Instagram or Twitter and find us at your pop filter email contacts at your pop filter hey everybody keep watching them movies gentlemen have you ever connected as emotionally to a cgi character as you do this weird little puppet (laughs) isn't this movie the case for going back to practical effects uh this movie is the case for it jaws is the case for it jurassic park is the case for it steven spielberg Spielberg. except for ready player one is the case for it i still that's not him man that was like joe little joey spielberg his fucking nephew directed that (laughs) i don't believe it was him hey i'm gonna direct a movie for this movie to work you have to fall in love with a puppet and you have to forget even though you know it's a puppet you have to forget that it is the way they made this thing come alive, its eyes, mm-hmm. his eyes dilate, his veins, you can see liquid moving through his veins. His head uh, does this interesting, I won't say weird, interesting pulsating thing. Uh, he seems so alive and his eyes just capture mm-hmm. you in a way that if this were a CGI Jar, Jar Jar Binks style character, that also, I know that they try to put like a weird little man in green in the place of whoever like Rocket Raccoon supposed to be or whatever, but it never works. The people always don't look at the thing itself. Right. The way E.T. and the actors in the scenes with E.T. play off of one another, that you need that love. You need that actual emotion in there, and that only exists because he's a real thing. He's a real presence in there. Not a tennis ball. I will say... For every scene they got where he, his face is, like, doing a great job and you love him, anytime they had to have this guy walk, it's, like, one step and then they cut away. One step and they well, cut away. So there are limitations as well. In in this suit, sometimes it's little kids, but there's also most of the time is, like, a two-foot-ten actor. Yeah. Which is the tiniest human being I've ever heard of being alive. And so, yeah, that has to be a heavy costume. And it must, yeah, right, for, yeah, for some of that stature, it must be a lot of but gear. I think the walking is part of the charm. When he's oh, drunk... Yeah. And the most you see it, you're just like, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. <laughs> like, Don't yes. you kind of feel like they decided to let to have the character get drunk because they were like, every time we put the actor in this costume, he can step once or twice, but then he falls over. And they were like, right. well, if E.T. were I drunk. rolling all over the time. That's what yeah. he would do, right? Falling over is, uh, like, I understand that Spielberg can sometimes go a little too far. And a lot of the falling over is used as a prat fall, but it's just the noise he makes. Like when the mom takes the flash camera shot of the Halloween costumes. Uh-huh. By the way, did you guys see that mom in that cat costume? Uh, yeah, oh, that's another uh-huh. thing. I don't think I noticed the, when I was a young boy watching it. I don't think I noticed what a smoke show the mom was. When I was a young boy, my father <laughs> took me to, Ran the down to Mexico. To Mexico City. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like it, she takes flash photography and just that whoa wow, yeah wow. honestly like the the how cute that is how funny it mm-hmm. is that's the kind of stuff that binds you so strongly so that you mm-hmm. could like you feel as connected to et as elliot is also and more evidence of being a latchkey kid i don't know if you guys were ever that. i was hardcore yeah i think i still sort of am yeah <laughs> it used to be <laughs> awesome although the sound of the key hitting the 
the lock still to this day freaks me out. I look around. Your butthole and, just clenches. Yeah. You're like, oh no, I'm going to get screamed at for something I don't even know about yet. But you, par- single parents were so busy that like you could get away with all this. They could be around yes. an alien, two feet around, away from an alien for hours and have no idea. And that's the thing, right? Like the, 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 the fact that they could hide it, that it could mm-hmm. be their own secret thing, that they could say like, don't come into this room, mom. That's how we find them. And then by the end of the movie, they're like all bound together and they're all working towards one cause mm-hmm. and that that is what et brought to them i would say that there hasn't been a more beloved uh creature let's say yeah um since et until somebody showed up and do we remember what Werner herzog director of 1982's fitz Caraldo, said about that little creature i would like to see the baby i would like to see the baby and that, and he's a practical effect, right? Yep. He said, yeah, like uh, well, we're just going to use this cute puppet until we can CGI it later. And he got as mad as Werner does and said, it's the eyes. don't do that. The, the <laughs> yes. It's the eyes, really. Because you can uh, make big eyes on a CGI character as well, but it, it doesn't read, the dimension doesn't read correctly. This E.T.'s big, huge eyes, really, like, that speaks to something deep in our brain, and we see it as, mm-hmm. a, re- as a real creature when we watch it, and those eyes make us, like, love it. It's like a baby to yeah, us. Yeah, we see it as a baby, even and, though uh, it's reportedly 10,000 years old. We would like to see and the baby. Drunk as shit. <laughs> Wait, is E.T. Like supposed, e. supposed to be an old, old man? Well, I don't know what 10,000 years is in their... Culture. Oh, to them? Yeah. Yeah, because he read his... I thought. I kind of thought both he and Elliot were like kids together. Like, Elliot's like, I thought yeah, we were going to grow up like together. They, they might How be. awkward for E.T. to be like, bro. E.T.'s I'm like, I've railed so, so many <laughs> other <laughs> E.T.'s. Fuck so many of your Earth I'm going to go home and like blaze and like hit my wife. <laughs> <laughs> like, come on, man. I don't, I'm not going to hang out with a kid anymore. I, I think part of the genius is having what ages the three kids are. They all bond with E.T. and in different ways. Having like the three-year-old Drew Barrymore... The eight-year-old, ten-year-old Elliot, and then Michael all are like react to him in different ways. They're like, "I want to do this with him," and ET is like, "Cool, I guess I do this with you. That's fine." Terrible parenting strategy, by the way. Why would you have kids every eight years? <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's, yeah, that's a, probably you can't because stand to bed I'm, your partner. Yeah, I'm guessing it's like, uh, you know, you have one kid and you're like, "This, this stuff's going bad," uh, and then you're like. I know what'll save this marriage. Another kid. And then it kind of... This will keep him from going to Mexico. And then you're like, you know what? Last ditch effort. Third kid. <laughs> All right. Middle one was a dud, but this kid is going <laughs> to work. A little bit of trivia. Uh, Gertie's line, I don't like his feet, is improvised when Drew Barrymore saw E.T.'s feet and didn't like his feet. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Also, Bruce the alien actually didn't work and that's why we see you guys when people bring up jaws do you ever just say that like it yeah, was called bruce. Fact. <laughs> i just go bruce <laughs> <laughs> all right what's happening now speed round it's speed round time guys here's where we're gonna get all of our points so uh pull your goddamn heads out of your ass does it matter uh the connection between et and elliot is never explained no mike, M- mike. Wait. <laughs> I'll no, give the point to you, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, Mike, you don't get a point for that. You know, I uh, I just I always thought like, ah, he's an alien. I don't I don't know what his superpowers are, but yeah. Uh, yeah. It, imaginary friends, when you have an imaginary friend, you go through the same thing as your imaginary friend. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh how lucky are we that there is no sequel to this movie, no ET verse? Is that a big part of the magic of this film? Yes. yes. This has not been like desiccated <laughs> by by like pop some culture. sort of cat poop. No no reboots, no uh reimaginings. The the closest is the thing where he re released it and then he replaced the shotgun with a uh, with a walkie talkie. And there's a uh, if you depending on what version you watch, like if you watch the four K version, um in the beginning, which I think is the worst part of the movie, the first eight minutes. Oh, I like that part. I think it's, I, I don't know, it's pu- put together weirdly for me compared to the rest of the movie. Uh, there's a lot of digital ET running around. <laughs> that's, that's awful. That's the that's worst stupid. thing you could possibly Just say. Going, <laughs> <laughs> Misa gonna run around? Just doing fucking kick flips and I shit spec- off the trees. Did you guys uh, see the Dead Eye Ghetto in Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers? No. Where all these characters live? No. Mm-hmm. It's a good movie. Uh, I am going to see that movie eventually. Early in the movie, Michael is well on his way to being uh, shoe in for biggest 1982 shithead, yeah? Yeah. But then we meet his even shittier friend who hates Elliot because he's closer to Michael, maybe? 
Although there's a line in the movie where I don't know if we're making too much of this, but Spielberg is talking about other sci-fi movies, and one of the shithead friends is like, "You can't come into the middle of an adventure," you know, like as mm. like, and Spielberg is saying, "I don't need the whole fucking." Uh, all of the prologue yeah. words in the beginning of Star Fuck Wars. Fuck you, Georgie. <laughs> yeah, this, man, this movie talks about Star Wars a lot. Like, the the characters are brought up numerous times, and it seems like, it's like, yeah, you made your space movie about everyone being mad and fighting each other, and then in the end, you tried to have it be about love. I made my movie about space and love from the beginning, and I out-earned you, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and he did. And I think it was very depressing to George Lucas. Yeah. Uh, in the tradition of ATM machine and DC Comics, is the name of this movie Extraterrestrial the Extraterrestrial? <laughs> yes, it is. That is the fucking name Mike. of this movie. That is correct. No, I assume his name is his name is like Ethan Trombo, the Extraterrestrial. <laughs> uh, it really leans into that Extraterrestrial thing. Ultimately, the movie is against it, but how great would it be to throw back a few beers with E.T., the extraterrestrial? Hell yeah, I don't, I, dude. I, I don't like the premise of the question. It doesn't. It leans into it being fucking dope. It gets a yeah. child drunk, okay, and it causes a lot of problems. The best thing you can do. I, oh, what? But I just think it looks fun as hell. Yeah. Yeah, dude. Just you get like, drunk and watch Turner Classic movies? Yes, dude. Let's just watch some stuff. Like, do you have to phone home right now? Could you, like, wait a little bit, dude? We're just getting started. You can see that in the back of Elliot's mind the whole time of, like, uh, he wants to phone home. But I don't want him to. I'll like, just distract him. Yeah, let's 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 drink beers. Bro. Et, have you ever done blow? Oh, you want to talk about last <laughs> key moms? By the way, she comes home with she lives oh. there with three kids. Smells an empty core. Yes. She throws it away and says, "Like I don't have time to deal with this." She picks up a beer. It's a can mm. of beer, and then she smells it. Like what was in here? It was it was beer. It, it was beer. I obviously I, I think she's trying to smell. How old? Because she's like, if this smells five days old, this is mine. Yeah. If it's newer, <laughs> it's one of my kids' friends. She is, but I, and I, like, some, I'm, I almost want to say, like, that's a weakness of the movie, but she's checked, she's checked out. She's in a bubble of pain through so much of this movie that yeah, she's it's just not a like, weakness. I'm not going to do anything about this. Who gives a rap? It feels very realistic. It's one beer. Yeah, seriously. Go to work. If my kid wants to have one beer, you know what? That's okay. <laughs> Go to work. <laughs> raise three kids. Not, he's doing not well. Home. And then also uh, hide heartbreak. Like That's a lot to do. Yeah. At least you have an Audi. <laughs> yeah, that's a nice car, man. That's a uh, I thought you meant belly button. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'd be disgusting if she had a ninny. Does Elliot being into the Hulk mean anything or just a moment in time? Oh, yeah. like I. That's one thing I like about it. The, the Hulk posters on the wall. A um, uh, Hulk light switch. He has a Hulk sleeping mm-hmm. bag. I, I like that because if this movie were like when they made it, uh, or when they make Stranger Things, it's always just whatever it turned out to be very popular is what's on their uh-huh. walls. But the Hulk, I think his show was on at the time. Yeah. And so, like, yes. like, that's the... Even though we it's don't not, remember that the Hulk was, was a big cultural figure, he was at the time. It just didn't really survive that. But it's not right. retrofitting what was popular. Yeah, it's not no, being he like... he was, like, the, the biggest. Yeah. If it was Spider-Man, it'd be like, okay. But also, what, what I love is so many... Other than this movie, everybody else I've seen it do, it does. Here's every band and movie from the 80s this yeah. kid was into. Yeah. And the way kids Elliot's age are, I'm fucking obsessed with the Hulk. You get this Captain America Iron Man shit out of my way. And I mean, I want the Hulk and only the Hulk. The Hulk is an extreme outsider, and he is yes. defined by anger and rage. And E.T. is a complete outsider, but he is defined by love. And so I think it's setting apart those polarities. I think most of what Elliot's into at the beginning of it is being judged by the universe of the movie because it's inherently about anger and conflict and materialism. And E.T. is going to help pull Elliot away from those bad cultural influences. Plus, what was that version of the Hulk famous for? Goes to a town, has an adventure, gets the and fuck then, out of town. And then heads out. Yeah, yeah and people are music. like, stay. And he's like, I can't, man. I gotta move on. I would murder you and your wife. When I he, cannot stay. <laughs> when the three friends of Michael, uh, like Michael gives them instructions, and they're now in the adventure, uh, and it like has this pan across all their faces, and they're like putting on their hats and goggles. Were you guys just like, this is why we have Stranger Things? Just that. Oh one yeah, dude. Yeah. Shot. Every part of this and movie. also <laughs> all the the five professional BMX adults yeah. jumping off of cop cars is why that that, that was. I was surprised. I was like, oh, this is why their masks make sense. But sometimes they're, they they grew eight inches those days. All right, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, let's give this movie some awards, finally. Hey, guys, thank you so much for listening so far. And let me just tell you that everything ahead of this commercial is much better than what came before it. That's my guarantee. While I have you here, let me tell you about a website. It's called yourpopfilter.com. And it's everything you need that's related to pop filter. 
Everything Mike, everything Ryan, everything Greg, everything Cassie, everything is there at yourpotfilter.com. While you're there, go to yourpotfilter.com slash Amazon. Make that your new Amazon bookmark and do your shopping from there. That way we get a little piece of the action and Amazon doesn't. Make sure you're also listening to everything that Pop Filter has to offer, which includes the Superhero Show Show, a podcast that covers every single TV show that's based on a comic book or comic book property, and Movie of the Year, where we sit down and try and figure out what is the single greatest movie of any given year. That's Superhero Show Show, that's Movie of the Year, and that's yourpopfilter.com. Rate, subscribe, review. It's Bye. time for the awards. And we're going to start, so as to not allow me to forget to do it, with recommendations. <laughs> That's awesome. That's a good idea, dude. Uh, E.T., uh, recommendable movie by me and Greg. Um, some of us are soulless Trump voters who don't think it's good. So, Mike, we'll start with you. What would you recommend if you didn't like E.T.? If you want to... No, I didn't... <laughs> If you want to hang out, watch kids hanging out with monsters and learning some monsters are good and some are not good, I would say what I almost always say in this situation is, do you know what what, uh, Drew Barrymore and E.T. remind me of is Phoebe the Phoebes. Wow. How many recommendations has this been for you, Mike? (laughs) And Frankenstein in the Monster Squad. (laughs) You have recommended Monster Squad more than I've recommended The Last Boy Scout. The minute one listener... Hits us up and says, I watched it. I will stop recommending it for everything. <laughs> Listeners, Did you please. like come and see? You know what else really, I think, <laughs> narrowed in on the horrors of war? Didn't you think that, what's his name? The Stephen King rule shirt? Mm-hmm. By the end of the Monster Sean. Squad, he, Sean was, had basically gone through as much as the kid from Come and See did. His face <laughs> also was hallowed out, yes. <laughs> Those hallowed halls. All right, go watch the Monster Squad for the 42nd movie of the year in a row. <laughs> Greg, E.T. Rex. If you want to watch a movie about interacting with alien life forms and that interaction dramatically and fundamentally changing you as a person and changing the way you see and experience the world. Oh, and if you say the same thing that I have, you will get three points. I recommend Arrival, a movie that is about... Uh, some aliens showing up and people struggling to understand exactly why they're here and what they have to tell us. And by the end of it, um, changing the characters in ways that that you don't necessarily expect to see coming. Also deals with loss. Also deals with um, love and a higher higher love, Ryan. Uh, (laughs) And it's just such a good, dope, fun interesting kind of scary kind of creepy at times but ultimately really cool and i think life affirming movie arrival arrival is great i have not seen it a second time but uh i think it's my favorite uh dv movie if i had to think about them all real quick um i am going to i thought greg was going to say mine uh Mine I, is... I hoped that I was going to. I know. It would have been I got so many excited. Points. I could feel like a little bit of energy when you're like, oh, is Greg going <sighs> to say mine? I was like, I think I am. I, and then I could tell right away I didn't. And I was like, no. But I mine is I Gremlins 2 with Greta the Gremlins. <laughs> Gremlins 2. Yeah, I think that <laughs> Gremlins 2. the things the E.T. does, the very specific things that it does to me, which is sort of like, I don't know. It's like Spielberg created this thing where he goes into the past, pulls blood, like, uh, I don't know, ancient blood out of his childhood and then uses that blood that he found in mosquitoes that is stuck in amber to oh. recreate new worlds. <laughs> um, the only other movie that I can think of about a kid and his alien that does this stuff to me is The Iron Giant. And I know that it's not... At this point, like, it's overrated, maybe. That's not true. It's a wonderful movie. But it's, like, it's not a sleeper hit like it had no. been for years. But I still don't think enough people have seen it. I don't think enough people have talked about it. Uh, or you could just watch Ready Player One because he's in that. That is true. So, the Iron Giant is in yeah. there. Is E.T. in Ready Player One? Or RP1 Probably. as the cool kids call it? I don't think so. And that's They're saving him for cheesy. the sequel. We put your stuff in there, brah. <laughs> I think is he there? avoided his stuff on purpose. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. He's like, well, I don't want to ruin my stuff. No, yeah. I don't want to be associated with this crap-ass movie. It's all Zemeckis' stuff. So it's just Forrest Gump running on top of the DeLorean. <laughs> <laughs> Throwing chocolates and each chocolate explodes as it hits a bad guy. Wait, for you to make a movie that is nonstop movie references and for me to be like, I don't care. Like, that's, that's impressive. 
I mean, the movie's promise is that that is literally all it will bring to the table. <laughs> that is like, true. That's all you're getting, so I hope you like that. Uh, this movie won four Academy Awards, including one to John Williams for most amount of music in a movie. Uh, let's, <laughs> give it, let's give it five more awards, starting with Time You Most Wanted to Hug E.T., Mike. <sighs> Elliot is dying. E.T. is a piece of turd crap. And the mom <laughs> is just trying to drag everybody away. And I was like, no, you need to hug this little alien. This is when he needs people the most. He needs a mom. so upset. He might, he's not from Mars, but he still needs moms. Who are from Venus. <laughs> All right, so uh, needs a mom. Greg, what do you got? Uh, the time I most wanted to hug E.T. was uh, when he's like, before he's about to get his picture taken, he's kind of rocking back and forth. And then the flash hits and he goes like, Whoa! and falls back. <laughs> That's when I realized that like, I had like, real emotional attachment to this little puppet i wanted to run over and put him on his feet and hug him and just be like you're so cute i love you oh my god kiss the top of his head yeah you would kiss the top of his head right? i would kiss like the top of his head of course. and so as you go in to kiss the top of his head he'll like just extend his neck to come meet you halfway so, you're good he knows you have a bad back <laughs> Man, i do he'd be so great on a team where if a fence was not three feet but instead three and a half feet he could look right over that fence <laughs> uh, i'm gonna give that one to mike though what a fucking Rip can, roar and scene of emotion. Mike. Can I do an HM that I think is very sweet and I don't know when else we would talk about it? Is uh Elliot does the Reese's PCs trail and he gives that he puts them back on Elliot's blanket. He returns yeah. the can. He's not what actually eating sweetie. them, he's just collecting them. Uh, don't, don't forget this stuff. Greg, time ET scared the fuck out of you. Okay. So I don't think he spends that I don't think Spielberg spends that much time like making us afraid of ET, because that's the whole point, is he doesn't want us to be afraid. But when E.T., when Drew Barrymore first sees E.T., and E.T. screams and she screams, that's spooky. I don't like when he screams. <laughs> and then I Michael don't... knocks the books over, and it's a chaotic moment. Yeah, and yeah. It, like when I was, this comes from when I was a kid, really. I was like a scaredy cat even more as a kid. But Whoa. that's sp- yeah, <laughs> that Jesus. part spooked me. <laughs> Holy shit, how did you survive? Mike, what do you got? Uh, mine is, uh, it just... The most was like, don't do that, even though you know E.T.'s not going to hurt him, is they're both in Elliot's room, and Elliot just backs up and goes on Lazy Boy and falls asleep. I'm like, this alien dude is still staring at you. You he might fucking slice wake your, your ass throat. up. No, I think it's important to just fall asleep and hope everything's okay when you wake <laughs> up. Uh, yeah, that um, th- I'm going to give it to Greg because it's also the scene that made my daughter go, I'm done with this movie. <laughs> <laughs> She's one and a half. She just saw a time where four people were screaming wildly different screams at the same time. Did she do a fifth? Yeah, she drank a fifth of vodka. Dare her to drive, Mike? She's just a baby. She can't drink and drive like that. It's not Eminem. Uh, Cringiest moment obviously goes to what Mike just said, but (laughs) from E.T., Mike, what is it? Uh, I, there's not a lot. I think if I have to choose one is you're not going as a terrorist, but all the guys are. <laughs> and the movie, I don't know. It, it's not playing it for anything. It's just a fact. I don't. But did did she talk him out of it and then he changed costumes? He kind of did a half in, half out thing, I feel he, like. I think he had his beard already on and his face. When he was a homeless, his face was, was dirty, but I think his face was supposed to be darkened. Was this the time of everybody wearing t-shirts that said Ayatollah Asahola? Yes. <laughs> like, a lot of Middle Eastern hate at this time, right? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And the, thankfully, the, never again. Because ter- of the terrorism in the 70s, and we talked about that. But, yeah, like, the, so that's why that terrorism was different terrorism than we were afraid of, but uh, still Middle Eastern, I guess. Well, uh, our terrorists actually did shit, not like those weak-ass terrorists in the 70s. <laughs> Christ. Greg, go. Uh, what am I doing? Cringiest moment. Cringiest moment. Uh, and again, it can't be the thing that Mike just said for the second time in a row. There is such a sweet scene where Mama is reading to uh, what's her name, Gertie, uh-huh. uh, and there she's reading from Peter Pan, and like in so many other parts, that what she's reading syncs up perfectly to the story. But it includes the word Redskins, uh-huh. and uh, mm. I did cringe because you hear that word and it's very offensive, and so it, it makes you cringe. But also, I realized. What a sweet scene, mama reading to daughter, and that's how ingrained racism is in our culture. Right. Like people who worry about critical race theory, the reason critical race theory exists at all is because the way we in, we get racism is at our mother's breast, basically. Right. It is put into us as even little babies in, in our stories that were read before we go to bed. And I just think that shows you how pervasive racism is. And it in a in a movie that's otherwise not cringy. Like right. it, it, it is Peter Pan that is cringy and in this movie. 
they could have so easily said Peter Pan and the Washington football team. <laughs> the commanders. And I'm so glad that Spielberg stepped up and said, Peter Pan was cringy in this movie. How can I make it even cringier? You know what? <laughs> Double down. You uh, need a mother very badly. Greg sounded smarter, but Mike, closer to the spirit of the award, so you get it by a hair. Mike. Uh, director's signature moment. We have already de- declared this to be the Spielbergiest moment of all time. Yes. So, and watching this movie, I feel like, so what have we done? We've done Jaws, AI, Color Purple. Color Purple. Hook. Hook. <laughs> Jesus, we have. Fucking sucks. Uh, and so, then I know it doesn't count, but like Goonies felt so much like yeah. a Spielberg movie. I mean, it was Amblin. So uh, Greg, uh, director signature. Um, the When we watched AI, I noticed the light in that movie so much. And then it was like, okay, the, he does that a lot. And so I was prepared for that in E.T. The light is almost over the top in that way that we've described where like if anybody else did it, they would do it in a way that's over the top. The light that pours out of the shed specifically uh-huh. is my Spielbergiest moment. I don't know what kind of light bulb is in that shed, but dealing with the themes of light and darkness and um, like making that a literal thing by having this extremely bright light come out of the shed, it just it made me think so much of everything else he's done with all this bright lighting. And it's such a it's it's a, yet another thing of like Elliot needs to do the same. They're uh, like. The way, first of all, the house looks, you know, it has this like very steep driveway that looks just like the gate yeah, that comes down. Very spaceshipy, out of, yeah. Yeah, and Whoa. when their the, kitchen is more like, like a commissar than a regular kitchen, it's got like a little bench on it. Yeah, and when the uh, basically astronauts, right? They're supposed to be hazmat suits, but they look like astronauts. No, no, the, the first I, wave, I they are in as, they're in NASA ass astronaut outfit. <laughs> That's a NASA ass astronaut. I think they do that because they thought maybe ET would, give, would shed radiation. But to the yeah. suit yeah. to protect them. But that's when that like, he really hits with the light because a lot of times with Spielberg, uh, light brings darkness, and it's just another way that makes it look like this house is as spaceshipy as the spaceship. Yeah, for sure. Mike, what do you got? Uh, in the vein of this house uh, is just as spaceshipy. Is he? I feel like he gets his director sir, director signature shot out of the way immediately. Uh, Et is walking through the redwoods, and there's the blue smoke. And this motherfucker loves that blue smoke. And the trees, the earth looks so alien. Mm. And E.T. is like, this place is crazy. Nothing like what I know. And it makes the viewer feel like it's alien. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. But I talk about Spielberg's light so much. That was sort of a layup for you guys. So I have to go with Greg here. Uh, Mike, pound for pound performance. Something that we have not talked about. Yeah. We've talked about the performance of a puppet. But there are absolutely incredible performances in this movie. Mike, who are you going with? Yeah, I don't think there's anybody who's bad. Uh, I have to. I think well, you can government. watch this four year old and be like, "Yeah, I can see why she'll be a star for the next fifty years." Uh, what Gertie does and what Drew Barrymore gets away with that I think would be cringy watching any other actress doing. Uh, I, I, it's why the world fell in love with her. It's so like this is the case for all the kids, but it's so not. There's like we take away all that precociousness. Mm-hmm. That we love, like when kids are like, they sound like they're 40. Isn't that hilarious? And there's so many things where, like, like the line about, I don't like his feet. Yeah. Gertie just feels like they are shooting the outtakes or shooting the rehearsal. Yeah. And she's not trying. That goes with all three of the kids. Greg? The, yeah. The way she drops jokes, is he a pig? Because he eats like one. Yeah. Like, it should feel forced and it doesn't. Or something that would never be in a script of Gertie just repeating the things that her older brother said. Yeah. yeah. That's just something Genius. kids do, but you wouldn't write that because that's a waste of screenplay, right? I I think she is as close to a natural born actress as I've uh, as we've ever had or seen. Um she's interpreting a character as a four year old kid. It's not just th- I I agree with the idea that it feels oftentimes like they're just filming the outtakes or whatever, but I don't think that she's doing it reflexively. I think that this is a like considered and Mm -hmm. real performance and Spielberg knows how to talk to kids he speaks the language of children and so I think he helps them find the reality of their performance as well but this is maybe one of the most impressive acting performances we have in any of our movies because she's four freaking years old and because she's the cutest thing in a movie that has E.T. in it yeah uh it's a little bit of a shame that I think in you know she had such a she's had such a tough life, and it's not really I think appropriate to have little kids be actors. Honestly, at the end of the day, but putting all that aside, this is such an impressive performance. I got to go also with Drew Barrymore. Incorrect. 
Ryan. Henry Thomas is the single greatest Tune out performance of all time. That is Elliot. Uh, I cannot believe what this kid was capable of. Uh, just all of the screaming, all of the... When he... His reaction to E.T. being alive, and then his fake crying, and yes. then walking <laughs> past the flower that he sees come alive again, and then he has this laugh cry that comes out. Uh, I think they... The legend is that uh, Spielberg hired him on the spot. Like, didn't even want to meet with him because he wasn't, like, didn't have the last name of a famous acting family like Drew Barrymore. Wasn't Seth Green. (laughs) (laughs) My apes! Uh, But I think Henry Thomas has a chance to win, or I did think before this round, that Henry Thomas has the chance to win Best Actor of 1982 at the Moody's. Uh, So that's another point for me. (laughs) Those are the awards. When we come back, we're going to see who won. Mike, Greg, or extraterrestrial. Hola, Felterinos. I just wanted to interrupt real briefly and say thank you for listening. Thank you for your support. If you want to support us a little more directly, you can go to patreon.com slash yourpopfilter. There, depending on what tier you pick, $1 a month, $5 a month. If you're crazy, anything more than $5 a month, don't do that. You can get extra content. There's extra shows, extra series, uh, behind-the-scenes stuff. Uh, You could pay for ryan to draw you a picture Uh, i can write you a poem you can get the shirts off our very own backs all of that and so much more over at patreon.com slash your pop filter while you're on the internet you should check out shady monk he does all the tunes you've been listening to he's on bandcamp he's on spotify uh soundcloud wherever kids get their music these days that i'm too old to know shady monk lives there uh you can probably follow him on twitter and instagram as well that's shady monk wherever you get music Check them out. Gentlemen, that is it. What an incredible show dedicated to an incredible movie. Yes. Everyone agrees that movie is amazing. We're all sweaty. We're all tired. uh, Drenched our clothes. Yeah, I look like E.T. when he's healthy. Yeah, I'm white and ashen and (laughs) smell like cat poop. That's how I describe you guys from now on. Healthy E.T. and sick (laughs) E.T. Um. Let's talk about the movie and it, like how far do we think this can actually go? We're early in the season. Yeah. We don't know that much. We've spent a lot of time fucking around and watching shit like Das Boot. Um, but what do we think so far? Uh, well, before Mike came in and literally pooped his pants on air, uh, I felt like there was a really, really good chance. I was I was like blown away. Like, uh, And I think there was a differential between how good I remembered it being and how good I found it that will give it a little juice over even Blade Runner because I already thought Blade Runner was like one of the best movies ever made. And then when I watched it, I was like, yep. So I feel like there's, look for me personally, there's a big enthusiasm push on E.T. I was blown away and I think that might carry it far in my mind. Do you think the people who don't like it are just fucking shoving fucking shit up their ass and trying to sound shoving? cool? No, I think Man. they're just the, they're well, like the good adults you from this movie. They've lost oh, the joy. They've lost, like, the love in their heart that, like, E.T. and Elliot and I have. Less Peter Pan, more Peter Coyote. <laughs> 90% of the adults are helpful. You guys are crazy. Uh, dude, there's you, a are scene. Are you rooting for the adults here? There's a scene where the adults walk in lockstep, and you can't see their faces. No, that's crazy. But that, that's his whole point, I think, is to try to make them seem scary the whole movie. You never see their faces. And by the end, they're like, we got to save this alien. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of them want to cut that thing open. Come on. Like, a lot of them are like, Let's, what if that saves it? Let's we bust know. into this turn. And a lot of the doctors who they cast real doctors, so it sounded real. Uh-huh. Uh, a lot of doctors are like, let's inject him with this human medicine. No, <laughs> this human medicine. <laughs> that shot of the eight people coming over the uh-huh. hill in lockstep yeah. is so awesome because it's it's very dramatic. We know we now know that everything's serious. But also he does not fill the screen. Like it looks like <laughs> there's gonna be an army. And then yeah. it's just these six no, dudes with so those. much side. But uh, you can imagine. Side. Yeah, there's probably more. We're just the fast walkers. Also, like, uh, <laughs> we you, are the fast walkers. You see it, and you're like, I get it. And then it ha- there's like a cut to another kind of thing like that, and you're like, oh, yeah, I definitely get it. And then <laughs> it happens like three more times, and you're like, okay, man, I think it's time hey, to move right. on. Fucking A. What about, I got another one that's like the E.T. falling over. Um Elliot realizing he can pull the plugs out of the tube. Oh, hell yeah. The and then looking at and it when he, he pulls it slowly. <laughs> <laughs> Spielberg, like uh, Joe Dante was sort of like a, the guy who directed Gremlins and Gremlins 2, the new batch, um, was sort of a, I don't know, somebody who came from the protégé. Spielberg school. Protégé, let's say. Uh, it, uh, they have this, like, they both directed segments in Twilight Zone, the movie that didn't kill people. Um, <laughs> they have this, like, 
thing about Looney Tunes, you know, like they do mm. sort of like to have a couple, at least a couple scenes in every movie. That's like this is basically a cartoon right now. And also, it like it's so it communicates what's going on so clearly, you know, like you have no idea what the character is thinking. Pulls it out, yeah. looks at it like, wow, that You're made like, a big no, difference. No, 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 kid. No, we're friends right now. <laughs> Fuck you, Wiley <laughs> Coyotes. <do> it. <laughs> uh, Mike, what do you think? Is yeah, it could go very far. It could go very far. Oh, wow. man. Peter Coyote over here. Laying another law. Isn't Peter Coyote one of the heroes of the movie? Did I miss things? I'm so confused. <laughs> also, talk about latchkey moms. They're like, watch out for those coyotes. Okay, Elliot, why don't you just fall asleep alone outside? <laughs> <laughs> My tiny son. No, that's the thing about definitely eat you. Everyone only has, uh, you know, uh, X amount of gas, and so uh-huh. if she's asleep at ten thirty, after that, sh- there's nothing Look, more she could do. She already yelled at those kids for ordering a pizza. <laughs> <laughs> she, <laughs> she doesn't have it in her. To the make kids that uh, like fake finger banged her when she was bending kind over. Kind of sexually harassed. Is yeah. that what that was? Yeah. Those, I, I really feel like the kids at the beginning of the movie are supposed to be turning out really, really bad. And by the end of it, they have like righted their ships. But like they're all going to be like Kavanaugh's when the movie it's, starts. It's the, if, and they made it all the time to turn into Gorsuch. <laughs> is this the only time we've seen D&D players be the bullies and be evil? Yeah, like, dude. They're like, normal, like, <laughs> also, did it, an arrow doing mana damage? What? Hello? What? What I kind of arrow is that, my friend? It was. It seemed less like D anD D, and this is the appropriate time to get into all of this. Definitely it's Pathfinder. Uh, yeah, it's more like that game Hero Quest. You know, yeah, like, like it's more of a board game than a. Mm, I would be bored if I played it. I would be just let me use my imagination. All right. Really. And on that note, somehow, Mike, you scored twenty one points. <laughs> that's so low, Mike. If I lose to that's that, pretty that's pretty sad. hilarious. I'm gonna laugh twenty two. Yeah, uh, am I like not good loss. at giving points? About yeah. halfway through, you became so deeply invested in all the fire that Mike and I were spitting that the points just stopped. <sighs> this is just be, the thing about me. I'm sorry I'm so engaged about by say. you two. <laughs> be more of a normal... Pull out your phone and then you'll give us more points. <laughs> That's probably true. Just scrolling through uh, my Snapchat feed. Whatever, you farts. <laughs> <laughs> you old fucking pogies. Uh, E.T., uh, congratulations. If this was the Mike and... Uh, I'm sorry, if this is the Greg and Ryan show, which it hopefully will be someday, then E.T., you could go all the way to the top. You could... Uh, go all the way home. <laughs> to, to the star. <laughs> but Mike is here, and this is a triumvirate. Um... Please stay tuned because we I think we're taking a little uh, bonus show, Breaky Poo, next week. We're going to have something fun for you. And then coming up, we got Fast Times at Ridgemont High. we got the aforementioned Fitzcarraldo, Werner Herzog, enters the movie show of the year the ring. Boat. We have so much coming up. So, as always, keep watching them movies. <laughs>